And I have <clears throat> quite a few copies of the Holy City up here. Uh, but I will go ahead and tell you next next Sunday we'll, we'll have a Thanksgiving service. Uh, be sharing scriptures about Thanksgiving. So this will be a week after next. But they're up here. I'm going to scoot them over here. Uh, kind of out of the way. If you need copies of the Holy City, uh, there they are. I, I don't have uh, anything really new as far as what we talked about last week, but I have some new things uh, to look at about things we didn't talk about, if that makes any sense. So first off tonight, look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. It says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And then turn on over to Colossians chapter 1. And verse 20. Said, having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him. I say whether they be things in earth or things uh, in heaven. So <clears throat> this part of, of uh, this new heaven, new earth, uh, let, let me just uh, read a little bit uh, from this and then I'm going to move on. Uh, he says this new heaven and new earth, it'll be a place characterized by laughter without tears, life without death, singing without mourning, contentment without crying, pleasure without pain, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be there as well as our loving Heavenly Father and the blessed Holy Spirit. And there will be a resplendent, brilliant, sparkling city called the new uh, Jerusalem. And so I'm going to move on from that. I've got stuff stacked up everywhere over here. There's no disrespect to your work up here, Miss Lee. I just uh, find some more to sit stuff. Amen? All right. If you haven't read any of, of uh, Billy Graham's later books before he passed away, this is a very good one here, Billy Graham, The Reason for My Hope. I'm just going to read an excerpt out of this. And uh, he also refers to 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 2. And uh, we read this last week, but we're going to read it again for a purpose. Except he left one verse out of here that I'm going to include. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 2. And we read this last week, but let's read it again. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And everybody has had that doubt. Everybody has <coughs> spoken that in their spirit before, that I know Christ is coming back. But, but when is it? It's been all these years. Uh, is, is it really going to happen? And so, but he's talking about scoffers that actually follow their own lust and they're actually being critical about it instead of just, just having natural uh, questions. For this, they willingly, this tells you who they are, they willingly are ignorant by the word of God. The heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. What that tells you in verse 5 is there are people that do not want to know what the word of God says about the return of Christ. They said they're willingly ignorant. And so by, by the word of God, the heavens were bold, the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that was in was being overflowed with water, it perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is the Lord of a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And verse 9, the Lord is not slack, which means late. That's important. He's not late concerning his promise, as some men count slackness or lateness, but he is long-suffering to us. For Why? 
not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And so we talked about that last week, how it just like the, the flood in Noah's day, God is going to clean this earth up, but it's going to be fire instead of by water. Uh, but again, this time, uh, just like in them, there, there's a group of folks just like with Noah, we, we believers won't be consumed. Amen? Right. We won't be consumed. And so Noah wasn't consumed, but he's referring back to that to let you know that it's not going to be, it's not going to disappear. It's still going to be here, but God's going to clean up all the sin that's in it. And so Billy Graham kind of touches on that here, and so let's read that. The earth was destroyed by water before Christ, before Christ's first coming. It will be destroyed again by fire at Christ's second coming, but it will also be cleaned up or cleansed. Fire can destroy, but fire also can purify. We see God's message reflected in flood waters that submerge the earth in the early chapters of Scripture. We can almost feel the fervent heat spoken of in the last books of the Bible. Flames that will engulf the earth, dissolving its elements, making provision for the fulfillment of its promise. What miner who discovers gold does not put it through the refiner's fire to uncover its worth? God is the master, miner, and refiner. The earth belongs to him, but human sin polluted it. He is coming back to reclaim what is rightfully his and has invited those whose sin has been cleansed to reign with him in a new heaven and a new earth. Do you see the reflection of God's purity in the promised flames? He will not dwell on a sin-invested infested planet. He will strike it with fire that will burn away the dross. He will restore humanity and its dwelling to the pristine condition that it was in the beginning in the book of Genesis. And for those who believe in him, there is no reason to fear the end because the end is a new beginning. I like the way he words that. Amen? Amen. There's no reason to fear. Now, <clears throat> I sent Jamie one of these. I don't know if, it, if you received it or not. Uh, sometime back, a couple of weeks ago, somebody sent this to me. And uh, in order for these things to happen, would you all have, you would have to agree? I think that God has to be who God who God is to do this. Amen. There's no other being on earth that's ever been on earth has ever been connected with earth or with the heavens or with with hell itself that is able to speak the world into existence. He's also going to be able to speak the world and, and through the fire to clean up the earth. But we, we have to first, I think you'd agree, we've got to believe who God is. Amen. If we don't believe who God is, then everything we've read, everything we've studied since the first week is all a waste. If you don't believe that God can do all these things that we really can't I can't imagine in our mind that they're that far out there, that crazy sounding that he could just reduce everything on this earth, make it all disappear, and clean it all up, then you need, you need to be saved because you need, you need to believe who God is. Amen. And if you can't accept who he is and he can do all these things, then uh, you need to search your heart. And so this gentleman that's a scientist, here's his name. He sounds like a scientist, right? Reinhold Shelter. Amen? Does he sound like a scientist? Amen? <laughs> his last name may former, I can assure you. Amen? <laughs> And so he's speaking with a, a Baptist pastor, and I never could find out this pastor's name. And so the scientist asked this pastor this question, where did God come from? Here's his other question. Also, how can you figure that a spiritual force can have impact on a material a universe that God, that, that has been created? Did you, you get that that I sent you? Uh -uh. Oh, that's good then. <laughs> That way you don't know whether I'm reading is right or not. <laughs> so he deals with these things right here, and it's important to tie in the lesson tonight. God, spiritual matter, and impact on a material earth. Number one, he said, where God comes from. That you're assuming, that, you're, that I'm assuming you're thinking of the wrong God, because the God of the Bible isn't affected by time, space, and matter. Now he explains this. If he's affected by time, space, or matter, then he's not God. That equals a continuum of all these. They have to come into being at the same instance. If there were matter but no space, where would he put it? In other words, if there's no space, where, where would he put earth? Right? Does that make sense? If there were matter and space but no time, 
When would he put it here? So he said, you cannot have time and space or matter independently. They must come all at once, instantaneously. So somebody please read Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. There are 10 words there that explain what I'm talking about. Genesis 1, 1 through 8, but in the first verse, there are 10 words. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. All right. So when he says in the beginning, is that time? Yes. That's time. In the beginning. Amen. That's time. God created the heaven. What is that? Space. Yes. Amen. And what else did he create? And what? Earth. The earth. Amen. So you have time, space, and matter. Just in Genesis chapter 1, yes. verse 1. And so time, space, and matter, that created a trinity. So time is transferred to the future because that was the beginning. Space is, is uh, linked with time. And matter has solid liquid gas in it. As a matter of fact, last week I asked somebody, please look it up on your phone and tell us that, that, that Earth's core, what temperature that is. That is flaming gas inside of the Earth. And the God that created them what we have to understand, he exists outside of all those things. If not, he wouldn't be able to create them. And, and you've got a big question mark on your face about what in the world does this have to do with the lesson? Right? It's all right. So if he's limited by time, he's not God. Amen? Because right. yeah. he is what? Alpha and Omega. Yeah. He's not limited by time. Time doesn't affect God. God doesn't see time the way that we do. Uh, a God that created this universe is outside of this universe. He's above and beyond it. But he's also in it and through it. So he's not affected by time. So <clears throat> if the concept of spiritual force cannot affect a material body, then you'd have to explain things like your emotions, love, hatred, envy, jealousy, and rationality. Now you have to keep in mind that this stuff came off the top of this guy's head when this guy asked him a question, I'm sitting there thinking, boy, he took a few classes I missed in school. I mean, he's sharp. He said, if your brain is a random collection of chemicals formed over millions of years, then how can you trust your own thoughts? Your question, where did God come from? You're assuming that he's a limited God. He said, that's your problem. The God I worship is not limited by time, space, or matter. If I could put the infinite God into my three-pound brain, that he wouldn't be worth worshiping. That's the God I worship. Amen? Amen? And I know that's deep and that's thick, but it makes a lot of sense. And so anybody's welcome to come read this. And you don't want to read over just a little bit more than what uh, I have there. I've got all kinds of books up here tonight. Amen? Mm. All right. Let me make sure I didn't miss something here. All righty. <clears throat> so... We're talking about the new heaven and the new earth. There is more than one heaven. Right? Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians 12 too. Turn over there in your Bible. And we don't really talk about there being more than one type of a heaven, do we? We just talk about heaven in a general term, right? Alright. 2 Corinthians 12 too. Paul talks about some vision that he's seen. That word expedient means it's, it's not good for me, doubtless, to glory. 
I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. And then there he explains one. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. So he's going back 14 years. How many of y'all can reach back 14 years and come up with a memory? Not me. Amen. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. In other words, Paul is saying that he doesn't know if this is a spiritual being or if it's somebody in the flesh. He doesn't know if that's an angel that he's seeing, right? But God knows such a one was caught up to the what? Third heaven. Caught up to the third heaven. Now, let's look at the different heavens as we get into the rest of, of uh, tonight. We're looking at your Bibles now to Psalm 104, 12. And Jamie touched on this uh, psalm last week. Did you, Jamie? I don't remember. <laughs> I, I should have known. There's one in every class. Amen. <laughs> Has he ever said that to you before, Miss Edie? He doesn't remember? Is it, is it a handy excuse? Yes, it is. So, Psalm 104, verse 12. Somebody read that. <coughs> So the atmosphere right here that's right above earth, he's referring that to one of the heavens. That's where the birds are at, right? But we don't have birds living in outer space, do we? No. All right, let, let's prove that out. Now look at Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13. Jamie thinks he's going to get out of everything tonight. I'm sitting there chewing on something to get him to do. Bother me. Isaiah 13, verse 9, said, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel both of wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. The stars of heaven and the constellations Thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. So these stars that you see in this other heaven, this is your second heaven. So you've got the birds that are here, and then you get up into the constellation, that is called the second heaven. Are we still on the same plane? Right? Getting thick, isn't it? Amen? Now, Revelation 11, 19. Why would God go to the trouble to, to have three different heavens? What would be your answer for that? Who should reside in the one that's above all the others? God. Does that help that answer? Does that help? Mm -hmm. Revelation 11, and verse 19. The temple of God was opened where at? In heaven. in heaven. There was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. There were light, lightnings and voices, thunderings and earthquake and a great hail. So this heaven he's talking about, this is above the constellation that he's talking about. Now move to Hebrews 7.26. He talks about Jesus Christ in the previous verses that Jesus was made surely of a better testament, which he's referring back to the priest that passed away. And he said, verse 23, they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. He's saying, look, after one priest died, they had to replace him with another priest. So he's saying there's many priests in the day. Why? There's many because they kept dying off. But this man, because he continues ever, that tells me that Christ is alive. Amen. And he has an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save him to the uttermost that come unto God by him 
seeing he never lives, and make intercession for them. Verse 25 tells you that if you are saved, you can't be saved any more than what you are. Mm -hmm. You're either saved or you're not. Amen? Yeah. Some people, I think, they consider that they can, they can, they'll be more saved if they do good works. Good works should come naturally as a part of our salvation. Amen? Mm -hmm. So he's saying you're as saved as you're, as you're ever going to be. Now your walk with the Lord can change depending on your attitude and how we approach our sin. But you're as much saved as you'll ever be. And then it said that he ever lives, so he's not dead, to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us. So he's, he's likening us now to Christ because we're saved. Who is holy, harmless, and undefiled, separate from sinners. And look what he says. Made higher than the heavens. That's a reference to the other heavens. So when we get saved and we go to be with Christ, we're going to be higher than the other two heavens. Does that make sense? We'll be higher than the one here. We'll be higher than the one that's at the constellations and the stars. Now, <clears throat> Romans 8, turn back to there. Anybody question, got a question before we go any further in this complicated stuff we're chewing on? Well, I really don't know. I didn't research and, that. And the reason I ask that is years and years ago we had the Bible and Brother Copeland came and he talked about the different levels of heaven that night. The different heavens. But he but the names, it was it was like odd. The, the names that they had. Yeah. And I've often wondered about that because I've researched it and tried to find Yeah, I don't know that there, there are different names of, of uh, constellations in the second heaven that, that he includes in the Bible. Different names of those groups of constellations that he includes in the second heaven, but not in the not, not in the heaven above the heavens. Yeah. Let me put it that way. But uh, it, it could be because this pastor doesn't know, I promise you. So <clears throat> Romans, anybody else before we go any further? You thoroughly confused? Well, what heaven will we, this is a dumb question, but what heaven We'll be in the heaven above the other heavens. Because actually, we're the, the way my Bible reads, we're fixing to take off someday and leave this planet, and we're going to go through both those heavens to get to the third heaven. Amen? So the third heaven, that's the highest. The that's the highest. Third. That's yes, And that, that, that's what he's creating, that new heaven and the, the new earth. So, but then we'll end up back down here. Whenever he makes them new, and that's where it gets hard to chew on. Amen? So Romans chapter 8, verse 16. We're talking about being saved. And, you know, I really don't have to read this part, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this. But it just tells about the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. So he's identifying that how you know when you're saved, that you, you're that one that you know that the Spirit of God is living inside of you. That's, how, that's your identifying mark. And then he talks about being a joint heirs, and if we suffer with him, we'll also be glorified with him. Verse 18, he said, the sufferings of this present time, they're not, you can't compare them with the glory that we're going to have in this place called heaven. Verse 19, the earnest expectation that the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. But he goes all the way down to verse 22, and that's the part I just mentioned earlier tonight. We know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. We're saved by hope. The hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees, why does he yet hope for? If we hope for what we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? And so he, he just continues on in, in that uh, part of the Scripture just as, as a reminder that the whole world right now is groaning, waiting for the return of Christ, in our trip to the heaven. And so uh, what do we need to be doing in the meantime? And we talked about that briefly. So go back to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Somebody please read verses 11 through 15. That tells you what we're supposed to be doing in the meantime. Second Peter eleven through fifteen. 
Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. All right. Anybody got a comment about that particular group of verses, about what we're supposed to be doing in the meantime? What is the difference between your long suffering and God's long suffering? Have you ever had somebody that you already knew in your heart and you've said it to yourself, you've said it to others, he'll never be saved. She'll never be saved. Have you ever thought that about folks? If we admitted it, we would say that. We don't have a long suffering that, that God has, do we? We don't have it. Only through Jesus Christ. Amen. That's really we never, we can never give up on anyone. Being saved. Because yeah. God's long suffering is much longer than ours. How, how long have we been on this earth? We got some folks here above 80 years old. And God's always been. And He's still long suffering. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yeah. You ever get hung up on that word willing right there? Well, Brother Mike, do you often wonder, though, what is it going to be that? Causes God to turn to Jesus and say, Go get him. Is mm -hmm. it going to be a person that once that that one person is saved? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. There's nothing. What, so, what's in the way of the rapture right now? We talked about that. What, what's in the way of him coming back right now? <laughs> and, so, and so, whenever he explains in scriptures that even Jesus himself doesn't know when he's coming back. I can't give you a very good answer for that. No, but I mean, I just wonder about it because you think, like you said, he could do this at any moment. Yep. At any moment. And, but you, you often wonder what's going to be that, you know, is it that one person that he's got his eyes set on that when that person accepts oh. Jesus, that, you know, it's like his decisions make, that that's going to be it. Yeah. Well, Shannon, I had heard, and I don't remember where I heard it from. It's been years ago, but it was it was a, uh, said that he won't return until every last person has heard the gospel. I've heard that too, and I don't know where I heard that, that until at least that's every person gets on But, but babies are going to be impossible. That's impossible because babies are born every day, <laughs> and, and <laughs> yeah, and so you know there. It, that's a that's a cycle that's just going to keep going. Exactly. Well, maybe it'll help us out that we know that, that God already knows when that is. Or does He? Right. Is something going to happen that's so bad, which we see bad things every day happen, <clears throat> that that last child that gets abused, or a murder that takes place, or that abortion that takes place. I mean, that's. You know, there's so much bad that happens every day. Well, I think that a million Poles and Jews that were slaughtered during Hitler's reign would really get God's attention. Yeah, I mean, that was Amen. his chosen, yeah. And the last of this other stuff, we just believe that he's going to when right. he says it's time. Yeah, that's what we have to wrap our mind around, and those are good, good things to talk about, but we got to remember, nothing has ever occurred to God God has never said, oh, I'm supposed to do that today. He doesn't exist in time like us, so nothing's ever occurred to him. He already, he already right now knows when he's coming back, when he's going to send his son back. Mm -hmm. So it isn't like he's going to wake up someday because he never sleeps, the Bible says, never sleeps nor slumbers. Right? And two, all things have to be fulfilled. <coughs> you know. Yeah. 
So, I don't know. Jamie, you got anything? No. <laughs> you ain't no good tonight at all, man. You just clocked out for the whole night. <laughs> you're not on the job at all. Man. A lot of stuff you're saying, what Miss Alice said, I mean, I agree with it all. There's things we're not going to know about the Bible, about God. Yeah. We just, we're just not going to know it. I'm glad you're agreeing with Miss Alice. That's important. <laughs> we right. know where we stand. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, let's move on to something easier to understand. Look in your Bible in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter, Luke chapter 6. Has anybody ever thought there's actually going to be laughter in heaven? Well, I hope so. Yeah. Well, it's in the scriptures right here. We're not going to just be zombies sticking our arm out, walking around, calling out on the name of Jesus. Man, we're, you talk about joy. But look what he says in Luke chapter 6. He's speaking to his disciples here. And so he says this to them. And look, what he, look, look what he lets them know is theirs. Just saying that it is ours as believers. Blessed be, you, blessed be the poor. What verse? Luke 6, verse 20. Sorry about that. Okay. Blessed be the poor. For yours is what? The kingdom of, the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you that hunger. Don't you, if you look back in the scriptures, you don't have to, but if you look back in Matthew 12, 1, he's speaking to the disciples. What were they doing going through a cornfield on the Sabbath day? They was eating corn right off the cob in that field. Yeah. Amen? That's pretty hungry. Amen? Blessed are you that hunger now, for you shall be filled. In other words, satisfied. You won't need anything in heaven. <coughs> Blessed are you that weep now, for you'll do what? You'll laugh. There'll be laughter in heaven. But the thing about heaven, it won't be at other people's expense. Exactly. Right? It's just pure, pure joy. It's just pure joy. And it's at nobody's expense. And it's also not watching the disobedience of, of children. You know, when we watch them and they do funny things in disobedience that we laugh about, it won't even be that. It's just pure joy. So we have those things uh, to look at. Now, Let's get into the part about the angels. Now, we got about 15 minutes. You want me to continue on, or do you want to finish up next time? I'm going to leave this up to you all. You would say you want to go home if you wanted to. All right. Go ahead. You didn't answer me, so you missed your shot. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. See, we, we are not going to be the only ones in heaven. We're going to be angels there. Amen? I know what mine's going to look like. Y'all ever watch that Christmas movie, old Clarence? <laughs> I think Clarence is going to be, be mine. What is the name of that Christmas movie? What is it? The one with Jimmy Stewart? It's a wonderful world. Yeah, that's mine right there, old Clarence. Anyway. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 5. So he's talking about in, in the, the Corinthian church, they were having trouble that the folks were, were uh, uh, not getting along. They had matters against each other. And he said, dare any of you having a matter against another go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints. So he said, no, you, you don't need to go to uh, a court of law when you have a difference with somebody. Uh, go to each other. Know you not that the saints shall judge the world? If the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? He's just trying to say, look, work these things out amongst yourselves. Know you not that we shall do what? Judge we'll judge angels. How much more things that pertain to this life? If you then have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to the judge who least esteem in the church. He said, I speak this to your shame. Is it so that there's not a wise man among you? No. That one, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. The brother goes to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. So he's just laying out an example there. But I read that about the angels because that's the way I want to, to turn uh, in the rest of it now. Now look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. <laughs> 
Hebrews chapter 1. Somebody read verse 14. Well, I'll tell you what. Read, read verse 13 and 14, please. And tell us what angels are supposed to do. But to which of the angels said, he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So what does verse 14 tell you about angels? They minister to us. They minister to the saints. They minister to us. Has anybody here had an experience with an angel? Something happened to you that you can't prove any other way that, that an angel of God was involved in your life somehow. Something happened that had to be from God. Not one person? Nobody here? Amen. I have. Huh? I have. Yeah? Can't explain. There's another hand? Yes. It says they're ministering spirits. Yeah. They're ministering spirits. Remember uh, that. Keep that under your hat. When you say so, that ministering spirits, in what way? What way are you saying that? Spiritually? Physically? That's what it says. It says they are men. In other words, they're spirits and they minister to us. That's what he's just trying to say. They're spirits. And spirits do what? What do they do? How do they minister to us? Do they, do they physically grab a hold of us? And, or do they speak to us? Speak to you. They speak to us, don't they? Speak hope. And I also believe that they can rescue us too. Oh, they yeah, I believe they can do that. All right, well, let's move on before it gets... Now, so, like Christ, you're going to find out that we are made better than the angels. So look at 1 Peter chapter 1. This is where I really want to get to the whole night. So sometimes it takes me a while because we're supposed to. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 9. He said, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. He's talking about the appearing of Jesus Christ, the glory of his appearing there in verse 7, that the trial of our faith, remember we, uh, we, even Billy Graham and other scriptures that we mentioned, uh, that we'll be tried, the earth will be tried in a fire just like gold is tried. So he said, uh, we might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love, Nobody here has seen Jesus Christ, but you love him. Amen. Yeah. Though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them which have preached the gospel unto you, whom the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which thing the angels desire to look into. He's talking about the gospel of our salvation and he said the angels desire to look into what we have. Now there's an answer why that we're going to see in just a minute. Who did Christ die for? Us or the angels? Us. He died for us, right? Yeah. And so his angels, are they are spirits. They're not physical beings, right? Now, why would they want why would they want salvation? They've been in this place called heaven, and if you return back to Isaiah 14, you see where that, that Lucifer was cast out of heaven because of pride, because he said, I want to exalt my stars above the stars of heaven, exalt my throne above, or even equal to, and he's not equal with God. Pride is what got him in trouble, and it's still to this day, it's his greatest weapon. That's why the Bible says God hates pride. I believe that with... Uh, <clears throat> on my heart but there is something that we have that the angels can never have and you're going to find out that unlike us God does not give the angels any chance for forgiveness right prove it look at
of 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. So why in the world would they want to look into salvation? I'll tell you why. Verse 4. If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So God didn't spare the angels, right? Now look at Matthew 25. Matthew 25 and verse 41. Somebody please read that. I'm really tired of hearing myself. Matthew 25 and verse 41. Okay, one thing you need to notice in there, you have heard your whole life about the difference between the left and the right. Amen. Believers, we, we are on the right. So when you hear the left, the term the leftist government or the leftist this group or the leftist that, that's biblical. That, that is those that are against what we believe in. They, some of them may not know that, but that's how they're referred to, and that's where that scripture comes from. So the far left is exactly the far left. It's not where God uh, wants them to be. Now, Jude chapter 1 and verse 6 explains it even better. Jude chapter 1 and verse 6. The angels which kept not their first estate. What was an angel's first estate? Where, where did they exist at the very beginning? Heaven. In heaven. They didn't, they, they didn't keep that. But left their own habitation. They left where God told them to be. And what's reserved for them? He has reserved an everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. You will not find in Scripture any place where an angel as disobedient is ever given an opportunity for salvation. Amen? It's for us. It's for us. That's why Christ came to earth. The Bible says that he came in the flesh, God in the flesh, to suffer like we have. These angels have never been through that. They had or given everything perfect. Man was too at the very beginning. But these angels resided with, with Christ in heaven. And they lost their estate. And so what did God do? He reserved them a spot in this place called heaven with everlasting punishment. And you won't find that I've ever found in scripture a place where an angel was ever restored. Amen? So that's why that you see that the scripture says that we have it better than the angels and the angels desire to look into what we have. But they can't have it. Does that make any sense? So what does that have anything to do with the new heaven and new earth? When God makes a new heaven and a new earth, including the angels, there will not be anything here that's imperfect, anything that's wrong with anything. He, everything will be perfect. There won't even be an angel here that's disobedient. Even if he's an angel, if he's disobedient, hell is his home. If you're disobedient, hell is your home. All opportunities for salvation will all be gone. And everything will be new. And everything will be joyful. And there will be laughing. And there will be peace. And we'll be with our loved ones. Amen? Amen. Now somebody asked me a question the other day about... If we would be like angels, I said, no, we won't be like angels. I didn't give the finest answer to, to her. I didn't finish my answer, but uh, I don't want to be like angels. I want to be what, what I am. I'm saved, and I had the opportunity for salvation. Amen. So we appreciate it more. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.
new heaven and new earth. <clears throat> going to clean it all up, but not destroy it. Just going to clean it up. Does that make sense from what we studied? Anybody got anything else on this one before we go home? Yeah, some of y'all are giving me that stunned look. Yes. Find this Jesus made for a little time lower than the angels. Died for man that he may will man a love angel and be the and to be the family of God. I guess that's all about when Jesus was here. He may have been a little lower, but that's right. he died for us that we'd be lifted above everybody. That's exactly right. Yep. He made lower than angels, which man he was made in the flesh. Is what Cotton said. He was made lower than the angels. That doesn't mean in importance, but he, he was brought, he would sit here in the flesh, God in the flesh. In the beginning of the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, for grace and truth. <coughs> so when it says lower than angels, that doesn't mean in, in, in habitation or in importance or anything. It just means he came to earth. Amen. Anyone else? Jamie, you got anything? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right. He's home and then the little go home. All minds and hearts clear? <coughs> All right. Next week's lesson's up there, but we're going to focus on Thanksgiving next, next Tuesday. So. Yeah. All right. Pray for Sunday service. Amen. And uh, look at all these things. And, uh, I won't get into it tonight, but some folks still have had quite a few questions about the difference between Sheol, Hades, Hell, the Lake of Fire, Paradise, and Abraham's bosom. I've been asked a lot of that. So we might touch on that before we go too much further into the next lesson. <coughs> or somebody's been asked, quite a few have been asking me about that. Does anybody here have questions about Hades, Sheol, the difference between that, Paradise, Abraham's bosom, Heaven? But if you don't have, I won't, I won't work on it. Does anybody have no, questions about that? No, you need to work on that. Okay, I thought so. All right. Give me dismissals. <laughs>